How did 23andMe go from revolutionizing personal genomics to facing financial implosion? And what happens to all the user data they've collected along the way? The story of 23andMe begins and ends with Anne Wojcicki. Her dad was a Polish immigrant who escaped Stalin's rule, landed in the US, and somehow went from running for his life to running particle physics lectures at Stanford. He and his wife raised three daughters in Palo Alto, California, Jeanette, Susan, and Anne. Now, Susan, we all know and love Mama Susan. She was the CEO of YouTube for a few years. Jeanette was a less famous epidemiologist. And then Anne. Anne grew up surrounded by Silicon Valley nerds at the height of the dot-com boom. After graduating high school, she attended Yale University and got her bachelor's of science in biology. Out of college, she got a job as an investment analyst for a new up-and-coming hedge fund called Passport Cap. See, Passport Capital was a hedge fund focused on specifically medical and biotech companies. And as an investment analyst, Anne had the opportunity to evaluate and study many different biotech company business models, see what worked, see what failed, and she was able to have a hand on the pulse of what was happening in this very exciting space. Now here's where things get interesting. See, around this time, the price for genetic testing was rapidly decreasing. What used to cost thousands of dollars now only set you back a few hundred. Instead of only scientists and the very wealthy being able to sequence their DNA, now your average American can afford a test. Your founder in Silicon Valley, how do you raise funding? Remember her sister Susan? See, the Google founding team pretty much worked out of her garage. Yes, it's that famous garage that Google was basically born in. Um, they started the company in her garage, and um, they used to have this whiteboard that said Google Worldwide Headquarters. And um, my other sister used to love to go in and erase it. While Anne was hanging out around her sister, she met and fell in love with Bryn. You know, the one of the co-founders of Google. They got married, and Sergey helped fund her. Her connection with Bryn not only enabled her to get the seed funding, but also connect her with some very powerful and important people. See. Bryn was part of the World Economic Forum. For those of you who don't know, the World Economic Forum is a place where all the most powerful and influential people come hang out, network with each other, and supposedly try to solve some of the world's biggest problems. The World Economic Forum is the foundation of many different conspiracy theories, but for the sake of our story now, through these connections, Anne was able to raise the rest of her funding from very reputable people such as Harvey Weinstein, Wendy Murdoch, uh, Rupert Murdoch's third wife, by the way, and then of course you have Sergey Bren. Um, there's a little funny anecdote that Anne shared about, I guess at the WEF, everyone has a name tag and it's color coded, which created this whole cast system. And Anne was just really annoyed because no one would talk to her for years because she had the tag of, of partner because she was Bryn's wife. With the seed money secured, Anne kicked things off by throwing spit parties. Essentially, she'd get rich, powerful people that she knew and throw a party, spit in the tube, their DNA sequenced. Uh, this enabled her to perfect the tickets, the testing, get the whole product cycle working. Um, by the end of 2007, 23andMe was named a technology pioneer by the World Economic Forum. They started off simple. At, at, the, at the very beginning, all they'd ever do was just give you a basic, simple ancestry report. You spin in a tube, mail it in, and find out that you're a 3% Viking. Fun, right? Uh, but Anne's vision wasn't just about fun facts. Pay attention, this is going to be important later. Selling your DNA test kit sounds like a great idea, but here's the catch. It's a one and done deal. You spit in the tube, mail it off, and ta-da. You know you are at 4% Neanderthal forever. It's not like your DNA gets a softer update overnight. Well, at least not yet. <laughs> this means that the total addressable market, or TAM if you're trying to impress VCs, has a hard ceiling. Once everyone who cares knows their ancestry, you're out of customers. And if you don't have customers, you don't have a business. So, what's a genetic testing company swimming in a sea of DNA data supposed to do next? Cook crystal meth? No, not those drugs. Developing drugs is insanely expensive, soul-crushingly slow, and statistically speaking, doomed to fail. Unless you had access to a treasure trove of genetic data. Hypothetically, if you could cross-reference all that data, you could turbocharge the R&D process. Drugs could be made faster, cheaper, and maybe even more effective. But that dream was still years away. Back then, 23andMe was just a scrappy little startup with some attitude and a Rolodex of very powerful friends. Then, they decided to pick a fight with the FDA. 
or maybe I should accurately say that the FDA decided to pick a fight with them. In 2013, the FDA hit the brakes and banned 23andMe from selling tests without proper approval. We'd gotten a lot of warning letters in the past. Like, we were kind of used to it by then. We are like, yeah, you know, whatever. We get them all the time. But this one was, like, a lot more serious. Under FDA scrutiny, the company shifted gears and started getting regulatory green lights. In that first week, I think I just spent the entire week in my pajamas calling lawyers. By 2015, they got the okay to test for Parkinson's disease. That was the beginning of a bigger shift, from telling you about your Viking ancestors to revealing your potential health risks. And then came the big bucks. In 2018, GlaxoSmithKline, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, and in 23 300 million to start using their massive DNA database for drug research. For a while, it seemed like they were onto something. During this time, someone uploaded their genetic information to a public database. It just so happened that this person was related to the Golden State Killer. Using this information was what law enforcement needed to find and convict the notorious serial killer. Here's how that works. If someone commits a crime and leaves DNA behind DNA, that evidence is stored. Now, if one of their relatives takes a DNA test, the cops can track down that relative, ask some questions, and zero in on the perp. By 2021, they went public via a SPAC deal with one of Richard Branson's companies. Their stock peaked at a jaw-dropping $258 per share. From scrappy little startup to a Silicon Valley juggernaut, they were living the dream. The future looked bright. Remember I said about the constraint of 23andMe's business model? Eventually, they were going to run out of people to test. And surprise, surprise, that started happening. Fewer people were running to buy kits. So what do you do when your one and done product hits the saturation point? In 2020, 23andMe introduced a new annual subscription product called 23andMe Plus. The users got access to premium reports, health insights, and other shiny extras that weren't part of the standard package. But apparently it wasn't shiny enough. When subscriptions didn't take off as hoped, they tried something else, raising the, the price of their DNA kits from $90 to $199. It wasn't enough. Revenue continued to tumble. Stock prices kept dropping. Part of the issue is that the drugs they were researching took longer and cost way more than expected. In October 2023, 23andMe was hit with a massive data breach. Hackers used credential stuffing, basically a brute force attack with stolen passwords, to break into a 6.9 million user accounts. This is fine. I'm okay with the events that are unfolding currently. It's tough. Without a doubt, like there's been a number of things that have happened where I just look at and I say, wow, like we really just got hit. By the time 23andMe realized what was happening, it was too late. The damage was done. And then, just when things couldn't get any worse, on August 8th, 2024, the company announced a 30% year-over-year revenue decline, blaming the loss of their partnership with GSK. And the very next day, 23andMe was shutting down its in-house drug development effort. This was huge. 23andMe wanted to transition from being just a consumer genetics testing company to a biotech powerhouse. This was the linchpin. By axing their R&D, they were essentially severing the lifeline for long-term survival. And Wojcicki attempted a Hail Mary play. She tried to take the company private. Instead of rallying the troops, this move created chaos. The board imploded, leaving the company in even greater disarray. Here we are today. 23andMe is spiraling downward, clinging to life with seven months of cash reserves and a few options left on the table. What's the downside of genetic testing? At first glance, genetic testing seems like a win-win. You learn about your heritage, you discover potential health risks and how to address them, you contribute to groundbreaking genetic research, but what's the catch? As I've said before, your genetic information is permanent. You can't change it. If it's breached, sold, or heaven forbid, uploaded to LimeWire, unlike a stolen credit card, you can't call a hotline to get a new genome issue. Your genetic data is some of the most valuable information about you. It represents the ultimate nature side in the nature versus nurture equation. Still, most hackers would rather steal your bank account than your DNA. And now for something completely different. Why are biological weapons a terrible idea? And no, I don't mean the, the cringe ethical reasons. That's boring. The problem with biological weapons is that they're wildly unpredictable. Take World War II for an example. Uh, a certain unnamed country <coughs> experimented with bubonic plague-infected fleas, anthrax bombs, and other horrors. What did they discover? These weapons often hurt their own soldiers and civilians just as much as the enemy. 
Here's the nightmare scenario. Imagine an ethnostate with access to massive amounts of genetic data and a casual attitude towards bioethics. Theoretically, they could create a virus that disproportionately affects certain genetic groups. The U.S. Naval Institute cited that researchers, including a lieutenant general in the Chinese Communist Party, sees the possibility of specific ethnic genetic attacks on whole racial or ethnic groups as a possible offensive opportunity. Essentially, an ethnically targeted virus that would be asymptomatic in certain ethnicities, yet deadly in others. As if that wasn't bad enough, U.S. lawmakers appear to be concerned that intelligence officials might be taking consumer genetic tests, such as through 23andMe, and that data could end up in the Chinese hands. Back to 23andMe. If 23andMe manage to cut costs and downsize effectively, they might survive. If they pull through, they'll likely emerge as a cash-strapped business, and their vast genetic database will become a tempting asset. Researchers, pharmaceutical companies, and even governments could line up to buy access. But here's the darker possibility. If 23andMe goes bankrupt, their database containing over 15 million genetic records will almost certainly be sold off. And that's a lot of personal data to end up in the hands of, well, whoever writes the biggest check. What went wrong? How did it all unravel? How did their stock price go from this to this? It would be easy to spin a narrative about a privileged founder who got lucky, coasted on opportunity, eventually crashed and burned. But the truth is more nuanced. Anne Wojcicki isn't just some caricature of a villainous CEO. She carried the optimistic spirit of Web 2.0. Healthcare becomes less about the art of medicine and much more data-driven. Anne's original business plan worked for a while. The key to 23andMe's downfall wasn't incompetence or scandal. It was a simple miscalculation, understanding the complexity, cost, and timeline of drug development. Unlike its competitors, such as Ancestry.com, which carved out a niche in genealogy and ancestry exploration, 23andMe took a broader approach. By merging Ancestry with Health Insights, it aimed to be the go-to platform for personal genomics. While this diversification was ambitious, it may have diluted its focus and made it harder to excel in any single area. Ancestries.com's narrow focus on lineage gave it a clearer value proposition, and it became synonymous with exploring one's roots, whereas 23andMe is under threat of being delisted from stock exchanges. In the end, the story of 23andMe serves as a lesson in vision, focus, and execution. It's a testament to the fact that being a pioneer is as much about strategy and timing as it is about innovation. Whether 23andMe will rise through its current challenges or succumb to be another cautionary tale, only time will tell. What do you think? Will 23andMe survive? What are your thoughts on consumer genetic testing?